And after a year marked by a murder and countless suicide attempts, Steve Bradshaw reports from inside Feltham Young Offenders Institution. The programme contains very strong language, which you might find offensive. They burglars, they mug us in the streets, they steal from our homes and our cars. We lock them away here in the suburbs of London, in this vast complex at Feltham. We're jailing more young criminals than almost any country in Western Europe. But prisons like Feltham aren't working. Suspensions, investigations, uh, violence, suicides, um, it's uh, an utterly miserable, horrible establishment. Tonight, Panorama tells the extraordinary story of one year behind the bars of Britain's biggest young offenders institution. Over 10,000 times a year, the vans draw up and a young man walks through the doors of Felton. A transit camp and jail for young prisoners from the southeast. Some are on remand, some have just been sentenced. They are as old as 21 and as young as 15. These older prisoners kept separately from juveniles. Date of birth? April 6, 1981. And your prison number? FB968. Some of these young men are hardened criminals, some just boys who've made a mistake. Some are damaged and vulnerable young men who will have trouble dealing with this, their first night behind bars, as some former inmates told us. I got put into this little room on the side. You have to wait for your name to be called. When your name gets called, they give you a number, and that's what basically you are, is a number. You have a new prison number this time. Welcome back. Oh, beautiful love. And then that's it, you go get your microwave meal and you put it into a room on the right, and then you have to wait again, and then you go through a strip search, and then you get put into a cell. I'm 15, and I went into prison, like, I couldn't believe it. I felt like hell. You couldn't really picture it, it's somewhere you don't want to be. Just beyond reception, they face one of the few choices they'll be allowed to make for themselves. You can have a smoker's pack or a drinker's pack. The smoking pack consists of 10 Mayfair, a box of matches and a packet of popcorn. The non-smoking pack, which is the same price as the smoking pack, but of course there's no cigarettes in it. You've got some custard creams, a Kit Kat, some drink, a packet of chewits and some penny chews to make it up to the amount. Soon, inmates learn that young offenders' institutions are not all popcorn and penny chews. We've spoken to inmates inside Felton and to many who've been released. Some didn't mind being filmed, others wanted their identities concealed. They told us about their first nights here. When I first arrived into my cell, I laid on my bed and I cried myself to sleep. I was up for at least three days, really, no sleep at all, just thinking away to myself what I'd got myself into, what it was like in there, people I was meeting. Basically, I never felt safe at all. Basically, I had no one to turn to in there. You get people banging on the pipes, like, with bits of metal, like, ting, 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 and you get other people shouting, when they don't fucking bang on the pipes, I'll break your face, and things like that. Lots of abuse, lots of cussing to your parents outside, people that you love, trying to make you feel hurt, angry, so you'd retaliate. Fights in prison, they always start with, suck your mum. If someone says to you, suck your mum, they're basically telling you that they want to fight you. Oi, 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 number seven. Seven on the ones, oi, number seven. Yeah. Suck your fucking mum, you prick. What? I said, suck your mum. What? Right, that's it, you're fucking getting it, mate. If chat at number six come up to your window, he went up to his window and said, please don't say things about my mum. And he goes, what, why not? He goes, because she's dead. Then he just went, oh, suck your mum, R.I.P. 
Do you know what I mean? Things like that just makes people feel shitty. I couldn't sleep, so I had to make myself sleep, and that's by knocking myself out against the wall, which I was seen by a doctor after a while. What did you do? I used to head back the wall just in order to get a bit of sleep until I passed out. Why did the officers on duty at night stop the bullying? It's uh, it's huge. You, you've you've got to bear in mind that when you stick your head out the window at night, it's um, a chorus um, of of huge many conversations that are taking place. Um, if it's heard, it's stopped. Um, but when you stick your head out the window, there is just banter. Uh, a message could be passed across that establishment in minutes from window to window. The kids who shout from windows call themselves window warriors. They try and bully new inmates into singing nursery rhymes. If they give in, they're bullied even more. Window warriors is where like people in the prison know that don't mess with him because he's top boy. He'll stab you, he'll beat you up. You have a choice, you're either fighting or you're going to sing a song. And some people, weaker than others, they'll sing. They're getting to sing all kinds of songs, nursery rhymes. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, and Mary had a little lamb and stuff like that. Bye bye, black sheep. Bye bye, black sheep. Have you any more? <laughs> just on and on. It's just until the, on and on, until he, he finished the song and they say, sing it again, and sing it again, sing it again. They're singing it again, and again, and again, and again, until they turn around and say, I ain't singing it. And then they end up getting into a fight. You can't get away from it. You're in a cell hearing it for sometimes the duration of the night. I mean, this is, this is real psychological damage. These are kids that are absolutely desperate because they can't get away from it. These are kids that are, yeah, they, they feel there is nothing that I, I can do. Next morning, a bizarre wake-up call. The peacocks introduced when the prison's wings were named after birds in the hope it would help young people cope. By now, new arrivals have entered a world of distressed, disturbed and sometimes violent young men. In the segregation unit, volatile prisoners can be held on a strict regime for up to three days. This young man stands before the prison's new governor, accused of wrecking his cell on swallow wing. He smashed the sink of the wall, stating that he did not want to stay on swallow unit. You didn't want to stay on swallow unit. What was the problem there? I just don't like it on this cell. You pleaded guilty. I found the charge proved. Is there anything else you wish to say in mitigation? Why I should be more lenient with you? You can't go around smashing the sink off the wall, can you? No, sir. I won't have nowhere to wash, will I? No. Ten prospective alley days, three days solo confinement, seven days no pain, seven days no canteen. Thank you. Sir. No. I don't know why he did it. He says he doesn't want to be on that unit, but he didn't offer any explanation. If he'd said to me, I was getting bullied by other kids, OK, I take that into account. I will inquire further into that. But he didn't give me an in. Um, so I've got to leave it now, and hopefully that other staff will try and get some rational explanation from it. In the segregation yard, an hour of exercise and fresh air. But when it comes to separating more seriously violent prisoners from the vulnerable ones, there have been terrible mistakes in Felton. Our story of a year of failure begins in January 2000, when one violent 20-year-old prisoner arrived through its gates. Robert Stewart was a young man with a criminal record and a tattoo on his forehead that read R.I.P. Reports from other prisons described him as strange and a disaster waiting to happen. He had tried to flood his cell, been seen eating metal screws, and set fire to himself. He had threatened prisoners with a chair leg and stabbed an inmate below the eye. When Stuart arrived at Felton from a prison in the north, he was accompanied by a prisoner escort record with details of his extraordinary behavior. But nobody, it seems, looked through his file and he wasn't seen by a medical officer. And from my conversations with him, I don't believe he was seen by a psychiatrist or a, any medical officer. Um, I don't believe he was asked many questions about his past. or um, So there was very little screening, as far as I'm aware. Um, I believe that he just arrived, he was placed in a cell, and that's where he remained. 
how it was missed, there was probably far too many prisoners coming through um, for all, all the work to be done properly. There were other clues to the disaster in the making. As well as being violent, Stuart was an obsessive letter writer. Since he was on a harassment charge, his letters should, according to prison rules, have been carefully monitored. But Stuart was treated like other prisoners, most of whose letters were not regularly checked. One letter, though, was intercepted by Feltham, and it revealed another disturbing side to Stuart. In this and other letters, he wrote about niggers. There were, he said, a lot of niggers on the wing. But the rest of his letters still weren't checked as they should have been. The interceptor letter was simply returned, and a note about it made on Stuart's wing flimsy, a running record of his stay in Felton. Because that letter was of a racist nature, I believe they should have, at least at that stage, started monitoring his mail um, and done something about that, definitely. Each wing in Feltham also keeps an observation book. The same day the racist letter was intercepted, someone on Stewart's wing wrote, very dangerous individual, be careful. The very dangerous Stewart was moved to another wing, Swallow. Fellow inmates told us they realised something was wrong with Stewart. He obviously had a problem. It could have been a threat to other people because he just looked off key, to be honest with you. He did. He looked like he had some mental problems. How do you mean? Um, well, would you tattoo RIP on your head? Your forehead? It's not really the done thing, is it, really? I, I, I even spoke to him, I addressed him on it. I said, why have you got RIP written on your head? And he said to me, boom, that um, he, was, he, was, um, he was drunk and some girl did it. To me, he looked like, I don't know, he didn't look all there. Like, he looked crazy, like, with the tattoos, and I thought that like, this guy looks like, a bit different. The warnings that Stuart was very dangerous and had written a racist letter should have been passed on to Swallow Wing with him. But if they were, nobody acted on them. On the 8th of February, the violent prisoner who had written a racist letter was put in a cell with a young Asian. They were together six weeks. Prisoners who remembered them said they seemed to get on OK, but should never have shared a cell. They didn't look like the sort of people that I'd pair up together. I think it was lack of, um, lack of thinking on the subject. They just tend to just bang you up. They don't, they don't think about it. If it weren't a specific setup, yeah, it was just a, it was misconduct. They should have thought about it before they teed up people, basically. Stuart's cellmate was 19-year-old Zahid Mubarak. Zahid lived in East London. He'd been charged with theft and had been sentenced to 90 days. He was a quiet guy, kept himself to himself, really. He was, um, he was... He weren't a threat to no one. I couldn't see him getting into any trouble with anyone unless someone specifically troubled him. So that's what I'm saying. Even then, you couldn't even probably fill himself, to be honest with you. Among the prison officers nominated to look after Zahid and Stuart's welfare were their so-called personal officers, a job one prison governor said should be vital. We have established the two young men had the same personal officers, one of them, Claire Bigger. It's unclear whether they and other officers on the wing had access to records of Stuart's violent past and racist letters. What's certain is nothing was done about them. Meanwhile, Stuart's letters, which were still not being intercepted, were becoming more violent. We have obtained copies of some of the letters he wrote in his cell, just a few feet away from Zahid, who he called his padmate. On the 23rd of February, Stuart wrote, I'll take extreme measures to get shipped out. Kill me fucking Padme if I have to. Bleach me sheets and pillowcase white and make a Ku Klux Klan outfit. He also sketched a swastika, but once again the letters were not monitored. On March the 20th, the day before his cellmate was due to be released, the tone of Stuart's letters became increasingly deranged. He referred admiringly to them who killed Stephen Lawrence and threatened gonna nail bomb Bradford, eight foreigners and non-whites. On the night he wrote those last letters, Stuart finally snapped. He battered his cellmate with a leg torn from the cell table. At 25 to 4, Stuart pressed the cell alarm. A support officer looked through the flap and saw Zahid bleeding profusely. The officer who had a radio didn't use it, 
Instead, he went to telephone for help. When help arrived, Zahid, covered in blood, was still breathing. Stuart, who said his padmate had had an accident, was calm and quiet. He was taken to the segregation cells, where he wrote on the walls, Just killed me padmate, R.I.P., and other words that couldn't be deciphered. Zahid died a week later in hospital. And then we found out that he died in hospital. That scared the life out of me. I was only a couple doors away, like, how safe am I? I could be in a cell with someone and they could just kill me, That like. There was a different atmosphere after that, that. Like. Everyone, like, checked out who everyone was properly first before, like, everyone, before you, like, you move into a cell. Robert Stewart was convicted of murder, but the prison service agrees management failures also had a role in Zahid's death. Do you accept responsibility for the death of this young man? Yes, I do. What lessons have you learned? Uh, a, a number of lessons. First of all, that we need to do a much better job of distilling the information we have available. There was no excuse at all for us putting Robert Stewart in a cell with Zahid Mubarak. I've made that absolutely plain. Uh, to Zahid's father, uh, no excuse at all, and the consequences were disastrous. In fact, I would go further than that. There was no excuse for putting Robert Stewart in a cell with anybody. It wasn't just the fact that he was patently racist, uh, but his behaviour was such that it should have suggested to us that no one was safe to be in a cell with him. We failed appallingly. The prison service set up an internal investigation into the murder at Felton. Among those who gave evidence was a GP who'd worked at Feltham's clinic. He saw the mistakes that led to Zahid's murder as the realisation of his worst fears about the way Feltham was being run. I think it's a, a terribly familiar story, and this could have happened four years ago, six years ago, eight years ago. I think that the, the ingredients for these disasters uh, and these very sad situations uh, was certainly there all the time that I worked in Felton. For over three years, Jeffries had been writing letters warning of sloppy standards at Felton. He'd complained management was dismissive of his concerns. Dismissive of the inmates, dismissive of their medical problems, dismissive of the risks that were part of the package of a young person being in prison. Dismissive of children's safety, are you saying? To be really clear what you're saying, well, yeah, it's a serious allegation. Yes, it is a serious allegation, and I think that I would not have spent so much time writing so many letters as a matter of record to demonstrate my concern and my anxiety about the standards of care that were being delivered in Felton. Jeffries left Felton in April, but there was to be another, more dramatic departure. With the courts placing even higher numbers of young people in jails, it was becoming a political priority to make sure they were held in decent conditions. Over six million pounds was spent refurbishing cells and building new education and reception blocks for juveniles. For the first time, people who thought they could change kids' lives rather than manage constant crises were optimistic about the future. At last, I believed that we were getting a chance to do the, the very things that I joined the prison service for, to make a difference with these kids, to actually, to actually have a chance of sending them out less likely to commit another crime. But the courts continued sending more and more young people to jail. And last summer, Feltham's juvenile wings began to overflow with prisoners on remand and on sentence. Result was uh, a juvenile centre capable of looking after 180, resourced to look after 180, being asked to deal with sometimes 310. The overspill put into dire accommodation with nothing to do. Youngsters aged 16 and 17 were now moved from the juvenile wings to the over 18 wing, Kestrel. As juveniles, they were supposed to have more than 10 hours out of their cell a day, but on Kestrel, over 100 boys would be locked up, sometimes for 20 hours or more, in conditions that would have been unacceptable on the juvenile wing. 
orchestra was just about the worst unit that we've got at Felton. It was decided to put the juveniles into that unit, which I found totally ridiculous. Inmates from across Felton told us about being locked in a cell almost all day. Filthy, dirty, get treated different, um, locked away 24 hours a day. It's scary really, just in a dark cell, just with a bed in there, a toilet and a sink really, that was it at the time. And I just sat there really, just on my bed. Banged up for about 23 and a half hours a day. You can't do nothing, you're walking around a, a 10 foot by a 6 foot square all day long, doing nothing. You're there and you ain't gonna get let out to go out and play. If you beg, you're just locked up and there's nothing you can do about it. When you get so depressed and you just ain't got the will to live no more, you just think, fuck it. A lot of young men in Feltham are already unstable. It's been estimated as many as eight out of 10 have some kind of mental disorder. And some of those with little will to live have developed macabre solutions. There was a culture of hanging. Young people, as soon as they came into the prison, I think, were probably telling each other um, how to hang themselves. They would stand on the pipes, they would wait for an officer to come round, and then they would um, jump and hope that the, young, the officer would see them. One former inmate showed us he knew how to make a noose in a matter of seconds. Techniques like the one we're only showing part of here are passed from prisoner to prisoner. It was a kind of cat and mouse game between the young people and the officers, but it was a dangerous and a, at times deadly game they were playing. Yeah? Anyone else got any more then that could show to you? To combat the, the culture of hanging, Feltham has developed a course in stress and suicide awareness. Children as young as 15 are told who to talk to and how to spot early warning signs in others. They're told about the risks of long periods of solitude. Any more that you can think of? There's a lot of stuff that you can actually do to occupy your minds, isn't there? And if we don't occupy our minds... You know what I mean? Death is the bottom line. There's also a suicide intervention pack on each wing. Right in it, the most important piece of equipment that we've got is a resuscier. Yeah, if you find them unconscious. Um, there's a pair of scissors to actually cut anybody down, uh, remove ligatures from the neck. The reason they're actually bent as well is so we don't actually cut into them. As well as that, we have a hook, which is almost like a knife. It's used by just pulling it down and actually cutting away at any sheets or blankets. Because we're dealing with blood a lot of the time, we've actually got the rubber gloves and we've got bandages. Have you had to use this yourself? I have. I've had to use it four or five times. As we're in the induction unit, people are the most vulnerable because it's their first couple of days into custody. You've had to use it on children of what ages? Yeah, between 15 and 18 years of age. On Raven Wing, as we filmed, a code one, or suicide alert. The prison says suicide and self-harm attempts have fallen this year. But code one alerts are still so frequent, they cause little surprise. Uh, we've just had an incident here where a code one, which is known as a hanging incident, um, a young Kurdish lad uh, decided that he would hang himself, or at least try to. We would have roughly 20 a week, easily, that staff have to deal with. How many attempts at self-harm or suicide did you come across in Feldham? An uncountable number of episodes of self-harm whilst I worked there. Uncountable? Uncountable. Well, by week? Uh, I think by the day, um, there were phases certainly when I worked in Felton where we would have 10 or 15 episodes in a day. As the court sent increasing numbers of young people into this difficult environment last summer, managers at Felton warned their own bosses in the prison service and the Youth Justice Board responsible for allocating juveniles to prisons. But Assistant Governor Ian Thomas says nothing was done to stop the overcrowding. Should you have turned these kids away? Should you perhaps have refused to take so many kids? I'll give you a specific example of when the governor actually said, we are not taking any more. 
and was told, you will. Told by? I think it was the di Deputy Director General. Of the prison service. Ian Thomas was already disillusioned. What happened next led to him changing his career. I walked into the, through the prison gate at about seven o'clock on the 4th of August, was told on arrival that um, a young man, a 17 year old on Kestrel, was on a life support machine, had attempted to hang himself, um, had done a very good uh, attempt at it. He was on a life support machine. And I think from that moment on, I was thinking, I, I don't actually think I can continue to be part of this. The 17-year-old young criminal was John Paul Stewart. He was close to death, but he recovered and was sent back to Felton, where we found him in his cell, about to finish his sentence. I was dead. I was dead. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing that was keeping me going was the life support machine. About 24 hours later, I woke up in intensive care. Like, uh, tubes sticking out of me. What did you feel like when you came round? Humiliating. The prison had already lost two governors in two years. Now, in August, Assistant Governor Ian Thomas left, protesting at what he called Dickensian conditions. But it, it is a jail. I mean, could they expect anything better? If society wants to look after 16, 17, I mean, if it looks, wants to look after human beings in that way, I think there's a problem with society. Four weeks after Ian Thomas resigned, another 17-year-old boy came into Feltham's volatile and dangerous world. Kevin Henson was no hardened criminal, but a young boy who could have been like any other. He lived in Ryslip, a quiet suburb in West London, only miles from Feltham. Everyone used to say, oh, Kevin, he's so naughty, but my mum absolutely adored Kevin. And Kevin absolutely told my mum, they was very close. Perhaps even more than most kids, Kevin was desperately close to his mother. But she was diagnosed with cancer, and when they took a last holiday together in Florida, they knew the end was near. His mother died on his 14th birthday, and Kevin never really recovered. His life began to change. He started to drink heavily. When his mum died, he just went off the rails a bit and got involved with um, lads who were basically a lot older than him, because he was 14 and it was on his birthday that she died. He'd wake up in the morning and have a can of lager. I think it was just to, just to block everything out. He thought his life was so rubbish that if he had a can of lager and had a drink, everything would be all right, and it wasn't. He didn't drink to be drunk, he drank to the oblivion, basically. And then it, you just couldn't talk to him anyway then. An alcoholic in his teens, Kevin drifted into shoplifting as he got older. One evening he got involved in a drunken brawl in Ricelip High Street. He pulled a knife and slashed someone. He claimed it was self-defence. He was charged with malicious wounding but would never stand trial. On the 28th of August, Kevin, the ordinary boy, his life had gone horribly wrong, arrived in Felton to join the hundreds of other young men on remand. He wrote to his father about Felton and alcohol. Kevin spoke to me and wrote in his letters about Felton, saying that he, it was the worst place in the world and he felt he should be getting some help rather than punishment. Kevin doesn't appear to have been getting the help he needed with his alcohol addiction. And his depression was made worse by the prison's often complicated rules. His family couldn't work out how to get him a change of clothes, cash or tobacco. His sister did manage to visit him on the juvenile's wing, but she found it a distressing experience. It was horrible. There's all the other boys sitting around with their families and walking out as I'm sitting there with Kevin crying. There's like 16 year old boys sitting there crying because their families are leaving them, but they just seem so so young and, and just like boys with their with their mum and dad and it just doesn't seem right. They're just, it's like, um, it's, they're just treated like men, I think. I cried when I come out of there and it wasn't, 
It wasn't nice at all. It was to be the last time Kevin talked to his family. Next day, he went to court for a hearing, desperate for bail so he could visit his mum's grave. He was already asked got his mum's birthday coming up, another one, another anniversary to go up to the, the grave um, to lay some flowers because he just went up there regularly. His father saw him in tears in court but couldn't speak to him. And he just shook his head a bit and uh, he got refused bail and uh, went down to the cells, basically. He didn't get a chance to say what he wanted to say, which was, I, I realise that I need help and I really don't think Felton was the right place for me and, and I'll agree to any help that's offered to me. But he didn't, wasn't a, given a chance to say anything like that. Apparently he was um, told or taunted by someone on the way back to the prison that uh, he was going to end up doing two to three years in prison. Inevitably, kids are often distressed coming back from court, but Kevin couldn't talk to his family. What about talking to you as dad on the phone? Kevin got a phone card. We were told that the following day that um, they do have spare phone cards for emergencies, but they don't tell inmates because they might abuse the system. Kevin came back to his cell where he was being held alone. It was a newly refurbished cell but there had been concerns about some of the work on the juvenile wing. It had been pointed out that electric cables put in, ready for TV to be installed, weren't boxed in and could have made a hanging or ligature point. It had been remarked that this ligature point in all the cells um, was ridiculous and that the, the cells shouldn't have been certified as um, habitable um, at that stage. But what became of that, you know, I don't know. Kevin was held on Curlew Wing. During the day, as when we filmed, it's manned by trained officers. But on the night of September the 5th, it was manned as usual by one support officer, who would have received just a few days of on-the-job training. There were young men thought to be at risk of suicide on the wing, but nobody had spotted how distressed Kevin was so he wasn't one of them and wasn't specially monitored. And I understand that it was a vulnerable um, landing. Unfortunately, that lad was not on the suicide watch. Um, so I would say that it was an extremely difficult position to be in. If you're having to check on all those particular prisoners, and we're talking about one um, operational support grade doing that, um, it's a near impossible task, in my opinion. What training would that officer have had? At that time, um, none. Almost none. In the morning, Kevin's dad had a visit. And they came, they came and knocked to my door on the Wednesday morning to just tell me that Kevin had hung himself. Uh, and that they'd found, his, found him at about quarter past seven, half seven on, the, on that morning. No sound from Kevin's cell had disturbed the support officer as she made her rounds. Kevin had last been seen alive soon after eight. Sometime during the night, he had hanged himself from the electric piping. He was found by a prison officer next morning. Rigor mortis had set in and Kevin could have been hanging there for most of the night. Kevin had left notes stuck with toothpaste to the cell walls, all referred to his mother. He just wanted, they said, to be with his mum. And he left a last letter for his family. It was only handed over to them some six months later. Dear family, I'm sorry for doing this to you, but I can't ride this amount of time in here without seeing mum's grave. Being with mum and granddad is better than living the life I'm living. The courts don't give a fuck about anyone. I asked them to help me with my alcohol problem, but they wouldn't. they just throw me in here. I know this is going to be hard for all of you. On a number of occasions, I, I warned the management of Feltham about the risks of alcohol dependency in this age group 
and without uh, creating a heightened awareness amongst the staff, it was very often something that got disregarded and forgotten about. You wrote to the management to warn them. Yes. What happened? Nothing. Nothing? Nothing. No one cared for him in there at all, just locked him up and just forgot about him. That was his words. Just throw him in here and forget about him. Yards from his mother, Kevin's body now lies in the same graveyard, the eighth young man to die hanging himself at Felton in ten years. There's still to be a coroner's inquest into his death. In some cells, the electricity pipes from which Kevin had hanged himself still haven't been boxed in, as we pointed out to the new governor, who is appointed after Kevin's death. It just seems extraordinary that this was allowed to happen in the first place, and it's still there, um, even it, after one young man has killed himself. It's unfortunate that it was allowed to happen, I have to say. I see no point in trying to blame people. A, a genuine oversight was made, and now we're rectifying it. But you haven't rectified it yet. We are rectifying it on a rolling programme. The pipe shouldn't have been there for them to, to ever have hung themselves on. Whether, it, whether they were put in there and should have been taken out because they were obvious, or whether they should never have been designed and put in there in the first place. A lot looks after. It seems to be too easy for them to, to harm themselves, and lessons haven't been learned. And today, there are still many young men in Feltham who want to harm themselves. The most troubling cases come here to the healthcare centre, in reality, mainly a mental health ward with psychiatric care and special nurses. Some are so disturbed they should be in NHS psychiatric beds, and some say Feltham's just made them worse. I'm missing my mum a lot. Like, I was with my mum every day from, like, since I was born. I, I hardly ever without her, and like, being put in prison just cut me off from all that. I tried, I tried to hang myself in it. I was so stressed out and that. And like the voice in my head was telling me just to do mad things like hang yourself, just die, you're better off. And I think I genuinely want to die. I've had enough of this prison. It, you know, when I was on the street, yeah, I was like ill, ill. Yeah, but when I've come to prison, it's made my illness ten times worse. It's also a difficult place for staff. Last month, when we were in the prison, there were repeated outbreaks of violence in the healthcare centre, which we weren't allowed to film. Today, Feltham is struggling to cope not only with the aftermath of suicide, but of murder. Seven months after the killing of Zahid Mubarak by Robert Stewart, the prison service concluded its internal report. We have obtained a copy. It is a damning indictment of institutional failure. Yet it makes no mention of any individual officers responsible for letting Zahid share a cell with the dangerous Robert Stewart. We've also been told at least one of the two personal officers, Claire Bigger, was not interviewed. The prison service told us she did not wish to talk to us. My understanding is that personal officer has uh, gone to another establishment. Demoted? Promoted? No, I think uh, she's been promoted. The personal officer scheme was not working in other than a nominal sense. Now, that's not any the name, individual's the name fault. name was on the door. Uh, but she wasn't being expected to, uh, to take a particular role with these two young men. And we should have a personal officer scheme there and we didn't. Uh, but I don't think you can criticise her for the failure to see that this death was going to happen. When we visited Swallow, things seemed back to normal. But prisoners told us cells were much the same as when Zahid Mubarak died. Tables, just like the one from which Stuart had torn his murder weapon, were still there. There's nothing at all that has changed about it. Nothing at all. The tables are still here. Like he got battered to death in his sleep. It's, it's, it's still an option for someone that's in there again. If they didn't like their soulmate, they could do the same thing again. So they've been screwed down? No, they ain't been screwed down. Like, as you can see, they're not screwed down. It's, it's visual, it's not screwed down. You understand what I'm saying? If we bolt the tables down, somebody else will find something else to use as a weapon. I think we've actually got to accept that there will be some risks. Those risks have to be managed. But I think the logical conclusion of that argument is that we just take everything out of the cell. Whatever these unresolved problems, Feltham says it now has better checks on prisoners' records. But for records to be read, there must be a record to hand when prisoners arrive from court. And we discovered sometimes even this basic information is still not available. You're saying that inmates are still coming in here and you don't know what their crimes are? Yes. 
And it could be anything. It could be murder. I witnessed a warrant come in uh, a few weeks ago where it, uh, all that was written on the warrant was he was convicted of crime. Uh, whose fault is this? I whose think, responsibility is I it? think there are a number of agencies involved in that and, and we're on the end of the chain. Doesn't that mean that the case of Robert Stewart and Zahid Mubarak could happen again? There is always a risk um, in that something like that will happen again. Um, the tragedy which took place, um, there is always a possibility that might happen again. I cannot say it will never happen again. Despite the work on the juvenile wing, the regime for the over-18s is as bad as ever. We found these two young men sharing a cell built for one, with the toilet next to a bed. Conditions the prison's board of visitors call inhumane. It's too cramped, it's too cramped. Man ain't got no personal space. Many people want to share a cell. Um, but I mean, this was designed for one. Yes, it was, and it's not, it's not ideal, um, and I accept that. Although an extra half million pounds a year has been found for Felton, there can be no assurance the courts won't flood it with young prisoners again. I can't give any guarantees about the population in the future, but as a matter of fact, I'm reasonably convinced that the investment I have from the government will allow me to keep pace with any rise in the population for the next few years. And I am entirely confident, particularly now the refurbishment is being completed at Felton, that it will not see a return to the overcrowding that we had last year. Last month, John Paul Stewart, now recovered from his brush with death, prepared to leave Felton for the world outside. He was uncertain whether he'd be back. Do you think you will come back? Do you think you'll stay out? I'm going to. I'm going to try my hardest to stay out, but. What happens, happens, isn't it? Nationally, more than seven out of ten young offenders are reconvicted. In Feltham, it's almost certainly more. John Paul's already trying to run off with his prison jacket. What's that? <laughs> Gone away prison, isn't it? <laughs> Some say tough prisons for tough kids do work, or at least keep them off the streets. Confiscated that. But the record at Britain's biggest young offenders institution suggests too many inmates are harming themselves, each other and the rest of us. The, the society wishes to simply put them behind a fence, lock them up, do nothing with them, and then throw them out the gate six months later saying, We've, you know, back, back into society you go. All that will achieve is more victims, more crime. Yeah. <laughs> We're trying to reduce reoffending, and yet we've got a reoffending rate of 90%. It doesn't work. Too many young criminals leave Feltham knowing it isn't working. On my area, most people have been to prison, the people who commit a crime, they've been to Felton and they've learnt from Felton how to do the crime they are now come in. Like they say, it's there to teach you a lesson, but it doesn't really teach you a lesson, it just sends you mad up in your heads, really. <laughs> yeah, it's that mad. There's no such thing as re rehabilitation at all. The government are confused. They don't know what to do with these, ju these juveniles and these young offenders. Yeah, They just end up just throwing them behind bars and trying to forget about them. That's their way of forgetting about them, lock them up. But it ain't solving the problem at all. The kids themselves and insiders who've worked there say that Feltham simply isn't working. The kids go back on the streets, maybe even more damaged than they were before, and do it all again. Mm. Uh, certainly that can happen. We're dealing with very, very difficult young men, generally who courts are sent into custody as a last resort. They've abused alcohol or abusing drugs. And yes, many of them will return to the streets and we know we'll go back to reoffending. And Feltham has been historically difficult, but there are signs of a real change. Freedom. Freedom, but not for long. Today, John Paul Stewart is back in prison. Nothing in Feltham has changed his ways, just like the vast majority who leave to carry on their life as burglars, muggers and thieves in the streets where they and the rest of us live.